If you would, please, open your Bibles uh, to Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, and we will begin at verse 1. If you are able, please stand for the reading of Scripture. And these words, these words we are about to hear have changed the entire course of human history in ways we can't begin to imagine. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or, or water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed Father, in these next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Did you ever watch the, the, the news and you see the meteorologist get up there and tells you that tomorrow it's going to be bright and sunny with no chance of precipitation, and it's cloudy and it snows. And the next day you turn on the news and that same guy kept his job. <laughs> That's how I feel preaching a text like this. I, I'm not, I haven't even started my sermon notes yet. I just want to say that I'm, um, this text is so massive. This text has literally shaped the world. The parts of the world that follow this text from Israel all the way to the left on the map. That's the greatest part of the world. That's where women have equal rights. That's where people believe in freedom. That's where they learn how to read. Can you imagine? Not only do they learn how to read, but they do it for free in government-funded schools. We have art and museums. We have movies and poetry and literature and science. We have all of these things that make the world a better place. And to the right of Israel on the map, and I'm going backwards, I'm sorry guys. To the right of Israel on the map, they don't follow these things. And they have been killing each other 
for thousands of years. They've been finding new ways to do it. Women are property sold as cattle. There are still slaves on the map to the right, uh, to the right of Israel. The last African slave was sold in 1989. But the part of the world that believes what I just read now has a vehicle exploring the surface of Mars. That's how powerful this text is. That's how, that's how mind-blowing this text is. And now I'm going to spend 20 minutes stumbling over my tongue trying to tell you about this text. So please be gracious. This morning is the third Sunday of Lent, and we're continuing our sermon series on the covenants God has made with mankind. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at the covenant God made with Noah following the flood and the promise of the rainbow. We looked at the symbolism of the rainbow as a weapon similar to the bow an archer uses in battle. And we considered which way the arrow would fly the next time the wrath of God was poured out on all humanity. Last week, we looked uh, all too briefly at a very tiny part of, <laughs> see, the covenant God made with Abram and his wife, Sarai, and how God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah, adding his own holy breath to their names and their lives, symbolizing the life that God created in them at the giving of his spirit, and how that related to both Adam and his creation and to the the apostles in the upper room at Pentecost when God gave birth to the Christian church. Now this morning, we're looking at the covenant God made with Moses and the Hebrew people at Mount Sinai after taking them out of slavery in Egypt. And we begin with a very familiar passage of Scripture. We're looking at Exodus chapter 20, which contains the table of the, the Ten Commandments. There are three major groups who largely subscribe to the Ten Commandments, the Jews, the Catholics, and the Protestants. And each of those groups number the commandments differently. Why? The Jews see the first commandment as Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And while we as Americans don't see that as a commandment per se, but more of a statement, if we think of it as a commandment, it adds new layers of meaning to the text. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Protestants, Protestants and Catholics generally hold that to be a prologue of sorts, and we go right to uh, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me as the first commandment. We all agree, that, say, that there are ten commandments in this table, but we divide them differently. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, splits verse 17, uh, which reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's, in the two parts. One commandment about coveting your neighbor's wife, and the other about coveting your neighbor's things. And I think they're forced to do that, because we all know there's ten commandments here, and we've got to find ten commandments. And honestly, I don't think anyone is trying to be deceptive. Because Moses simply writes, and God spoke all these words. He didn't tell Moses, these are the Ten Commandments. Go find ten in what I'm about to tell you. He simply said, this is what you should do. Now, in case you're wondering, this picture here is um, a mountain in Saudi Arabia. Archaeologically, this is the best candidate for the real Mount Sinai. Rocks at the top of this mountain... Most of the rocks at the top of this mountain are scorched black, as if they had been burned with a fervent heat. 
carvings found at the base of this mountain show arrows pointing the people away from the base of the mountain. Why is that? Because God said, while I'm talking with Moses, anybody who approaches the mountain gets shot to death. God wanted to keep this place holy and sacred. And so they, they set up these perimeters around the mountain to keep animals and people from going there. There's a cave in this mountain that perfectly fits Elijah when he went to Mount Sinai and hid in a cave waiting to meet with God. There are streams, or archaeological ruins of streams, or, or, or stream, dry stream beds, rather, uh, that fit with the, the biblical text. We can't go there today because, of course, it's in Saudi Arabia. Yet part of the map to the right of Israel. But, but that's what the mountain is. Now, uh, let's set the picture. The Hebrew people were in slavery in Egypt for more than 400 years. 420, 430, not quite sure. They were, they were there so long that they forgot about the God who bought them. They had forgotten God's promises to Abraham. They had been slaves so long they didn't know how to be anything else. And that's an important idea. That's something that I want us to, to hold on to this morning. That these, these Hebrew people had been slaves for so long they didn't know how to be not slaves. So God goes through this special effects budget. He, he blows the whole special effects budget on this production by sending these ten plagues against Egypt. And each is more horrible and flashy than the last. Water turns to blood. Frogs cover the land. The sky fills with gnats. And then the sky fills with flies. And then Egyptian livestock, but not Hebrew livestock, just, just die. And then there's a plague of boils on all the people. And then hail and fire literally fall out of the sky, killing everything that it strikes. But it didn't fall in the land of Goshen where the Hebrews lived. Locust, darkness, and then even death itself, the death of the firstborn. And finally, the Pharaoh had had enough, and he begged Moses to take the people and go. But there's this massive light show, this incredible special effects display, the very visible hand of God moving in powerful ways to free the people before anything happens at all. And just a few months later... The people are at the base of the mountain making a golden calf and worshiping a God of their own making. You see, God leads them out of Egypt with signs of great power and majesty. And a mere few weeks later, they're complaining that Moses brought them out into the desert to die. And it's really easy for us to say, oh, look at those fickle Hebrews. Look at them. They saw the power of God firsthand in their lives and they turned to idolatry. What we have to remember, dearly beloved, is that the Jews are simply a stand-in for the rest of us. We, too, have seen the power of God in our lives. Weddings, births, healings, worship services, even in the quietness of our own heart, we have heard God speak to us. We've seen him move in ways that we cannot understand, and ten minutes later we sin against him. I saw this in my own life this week. A particular song came on the radio, one promising, uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, the song was called Zion by Aaron Schust, right? And it's, 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 it's just scripture, the whole song is scripture. And he's talking about the promises God made to Israel, and how he's promising that he will come and rescue them and save them and bring them and set them safely in their own land. And of course, they apply directly to us too because God comes to us where we are and he saves us and he rescues us and he shows us how to live. And one day he's going to come and take us and set us in our own land, in the new Jerusalem, in heaven, in a place prepared for us. 
So I'm, 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 I'm driving along and I'm singing this song and I'm just crying out to God and it's so beautiful and it's so powerful that just tears are streaming down my face and I got to keep one eye dry at a time so I can see to drive. Ten minutes later, this punk cuts me off in traffic and almost causes an accident and I had nothing nice to say about that guy. While the music was playing, I was so caught up in what was going on. I was so filled with worship. And ten minutes later, I'm bowing down to the golden calf of my own pride. When God brings the Hebrews to the mountain, he tells them to make camp and prepare themselves. Then they witness another astounding display. Now, don't miss this. Exodus chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people of the camp trembled. Now, imagine a trumpet on that mountain so loud that two million people tremble at the sound. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. God begins this covenant-making time with a display of power to remind the Hebrew people who he is. Smoke and an earthquake and the sound of great trumpet blasting from the top of the mountain. Then before Moses goes up the mountain, God speaks and we have our primary text for the day. And what is this amazing pronouncement from heaven? What is essentially the beginning of the salvation of the world? What is the first thing God does? He gives us a list of rules. Do this. Do that. Don't do the other thing. And it's really almost a letdown. We want some grand, amazing pronouncement from heaven. And God is saying stuff like, don't be jealous of your neighbor when he gets a new car. And not exactly. God gives us a list of rules, but he begins by reminding the people who he is, both in fire and smoke and in the trumpet blast and in the earthquake and in the words of his mouth. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Hello, I'm your God. I was the one who brought you out of Egypt. You were slaves for 400 years you could do nothing to stop it. You were powerless to save yourselves. Your grandparents to the 10th generation back and beyond were slaves serving the Egyptians. But I brought you out, he says. And once again, we look at our own lives. We look back at those years before we really knew the Lord. Now, I was born into a Christian home, and I went to Sunday school at a very early age. But dearly beloved, I didn't know God in a real and personal way until I was in my early 20s. I could tell you all the stories of the, of the Bible and, you know, uh, know about the ark and, and Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. But I didn't know what it all meant. It didn't, it, 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 I had it here, I didn't have it here. But even after I met God in my early 20s, I was more inconsistent than the Hebrews. One moment praising God for bringing me out of my slavery to sin and death, the next moment erecting idols to that very sin and death. Even now I catch myself longing for the pleasures of Egypt, for the slavery from which I have been freed, for the sin that brought my life nothing but pain and misery. And I nod along silently when I read the passage. Because the Hebrews, who are at this moment standing in awe before the booming voice of an almighty God, will in just a few days begin collecting jewelry to fashion an idol. I can remember one night when I was a kid. 
maybe eight or nine years old, there was a knock on the door at about 2.30 in the morning. You know, that time right after the bars let out. We were all terrified, and we answered the door, and there was this foul-smelling and bloodied man standing on our front porch. He'd been in Murray City, and he was drinking all evening, and then he drove home, which is what you do. No, don't, don't do that. But he, he, he drove home and he was, he was so blind drunk that when he came over this blind hill at about 60 miles an hour, he found a full-grown quarter horse standing in the middle of the road. And he was driving too fast and he was too drunk to even try to avoid the horse, which he hit at a full 60 miles an hour, killing the horse and ripping the roof completely off of his car. You see, the horse had broken down a fence and had gotten out of the pasture field where he had been born. This horse had lived and eaten and played and slept in that pasture field his whole life. And he breaks down the fence and he steps out into the dangerous road. So now we come back to the question we asked at the beginning of the call to worship this morning. Psalm 119 verses 9 and 10. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can I do what God has called me to do? David answers his own question by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. How do we walk rightly before God? By guarding our steps according to his word. By fashioning our deeds and ordering our lives. By structuring our walk before him according to what he has commanded us. With my whole heart, David says, Lord, do I seek you. Do not let me wander from your commands. And so it makes sense that at the, time begin, at the time that God begins to deal with the real sin problem, at the time God begins to actually solve the issues which plague the human heart, the first thing He would do is to tell us how to live. I am your God, He says. I'm the reason you are free. Don't worship anybody else. Don't make idols to worship them. Don't take my name in vain. Take, take one day a week, one day a week, and rest and honor me on that day. Honor your parents. Don't kill each other. Don't cheat on your spouse. Don't take things that aren't yours. Don't tell untruths. Don't be jealous of the good things your neighbor has. It's an easy list. I mean, really, it makes sense. We could, most of these we could easily see posted on that big brown sign at the entrance to the playground at the city park, right? Just don't, don't do these things. If we don't take a day off each week, my, my body will burn out. If I, if I take something that isn't mine, the owner who, who owns it will come looking for it and be angry with me. If I'm jealous of what my neighbor has, I'm making myself miserable and gaining nothing. Like the Hebrews, our inconstant hearts tend to wander. And the more we wander, the more we stray into strange places. But God sets up fences around my wandering heart, just like we set up a fence around the pasture field. And if I wander too far, there's the Spirit reminding me of the commandment, you shouldn't lie. That only leads to misery. And maybe I heed the Spirit's warning, and maybe I go ahead and get myself into all kinds of trouble by crossing a fence that was there for my protection. See here, at the beginning of God's covenant with Moses, he deals with our wandering hearts and our proclivity to sin by simply saying, don't. Because once again, God's primary concern here is for us and for our well-being. 
He gives us these rules. He places these fences around the pasture fields of our lives to keep us safe. And he does these things, dearly beloved, because he loves you. And that is good news indeed. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Blessed Father, we thank you for your hand of guidance as a loving parent leading a young child. We thank you, Lord, for the fences that you have put up in our lives. Father, we ask that you would help us to see them better and to obey them more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.